We at Mitsubishi Electric believe in the issue of climate change and we manufacture products to reduce emissions from buildings as key to solving this problem. That's why we are proud to be a visionary sponsor of Heart of a Building. Learn more about our commitment to eliminating dependence on fossil fuels here. Hi, I'm Paul Kreischer. Welcome to Heart of a Building. Did you know that buildings account for about 40% of all energy use in the United States? We're hoping to make a dent in that percentage. This show dives into building designs that are cutting edge, really pushing the envelope of energy efficiency and sustainable living. Along the way, we'll also explore the motivation from the people involved in these great projects. In short, the why. Today, we're in Weld County, Colorado, in the town of Gilcrest, population of somewhere around a thousand people. Agriculture, oil and gas are the main industries here, with Greeley and the University of Northern Colorado a short drive away. Gilcrest also happens to be the home of one of the most energy efficient libraries in the country. Let's go check it out. The Nantes Library is the result of about five years of collaboration between the library board, the architect, consultants, and builder. And before we jump into all the cool features that make this a near passive house performing building, let's find out why this community came together to build it. Today we're talking with many of the people instrumental in making this project a reality. You probably haven't wondered how many hair dryers it would take to heat a high performance building. Well, in the case of this one, we figured it out. Find out at the end of our program. Now I get to be inside with the former executive director here at Nantes Library and the current executive director at the Nantes Library. I want to start by asking why. Why was this building built? How did it come together to really have this be a space? And you guys have quite an intriguing story about how this came together, so I'd love to hear that. The town of Gilcrest is in our legally defined service area for mm -hmm. the, actually the Platteville Library. Um, which means the, the residents of Gilcrest have been paying the mill levy. That so is the tax. Uh, yeah. The tax, correct. Right. Okay. But we felt like we needed to do more for the residents to get a return on their investment. The town also has the high school right. as well as the grade school. And we okay. figured this was the perfect spot to put a building up. Yeah, there's a cool story behind the name of this building. So Gilcrest used to be called Nantes, um, although I'm not sure how they pronounced it, um, but it was named for the station master um, for Union Pacific here in the area. It was Nantes for a long time, and then it kind of died, and a man named Gilcrest moved here, and he said, I'm going to make this town happen again. So he sort of rebuilt it um, and named it after his father, okay. also with his the last name Gilcrest. <laughs> But um, yeah, so it's been Gilcrest ever since. I mean, the two of you, especially you, Diane, were very important in the shaping of this vision. You know, Naomi, you've recently become the executive director here, but who else were some of the people that were important in, in the vision behind this building? We have a very progressive library board. Okay. And um, we do have a couple members on our board who are really into sustainability. Okay. And, um, that's really how this whole thing got started. I have the pleasure of sitting down with three key people that made the Nantes Library project happen. This project, by stereotype, to do a near passive house project is oftentimes done in Boulder, in Aspen, in Telluride. Why and how did it happen here in Gilcrest? We started 10 years ago on our, on our main library upgrading the efficiency. So we've been doing this for a while. Okay. I mean, that's, we're 10 years into that now. Right. I mean, it's really nothing new out here. Good. And really, if you look at all your pictures of the old west, the, the landscapes and stuff, you see windmills out there. Right. Renewable energy right. on ranches and farms. If the, the basis for going sustainable is to reduce or eliminate your dependence on either fossil fuels or to get away from uh, the fluctuating energy bills every month, then absolutely. I mean, especially you as a board, you've got a budget a year in advance and you've got a finite amount of funds to work with. And so now all of a sudden you can plan a little better. You have those tools. 
passive house belongs in any building, in any place that you can get that energy model and the team and the vernacular to get along to, to make it happen. So why not Gilchrist, right? We live off of uh, tax dollars mm -hmm. and we try to be efficient with the tax dollars, make them work. I come from an area that, that lived off of oil and I've seen it crash. Mm -hmm. And there goes your tax base. Right. So when you build stuff like this, you have to build it for the long term, uh, build it so that you're not paying a lot in utilities over the long term. We're at 120 to 130 bucks average a month for electric and gas. Yep. And I think we're 4,600 square feet. That sounds right. Right. Or, or a little less. Plus we're trying to be an example. Yeah. We're showing that it can be done and it's not that expensive. I mean, this, this building wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. um, we saw another library being built immediately after this for five times the amount. And they didn't do these things. So now I get to spend time with Dr. Matthew Hort, Executive Director of the High Plains Library District. Matthew, thank you so much for joining today. One of the cool things that you've shared with me is that your library district has 14 other libraries. It covers a large geographic area across the Northeast. What's been some of the reaction from other parts of the library district towards this building, towards this project? Yeah, it's really interesting with our district. Just as you mentioned, it's, it's really large. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got about 3,000 square miles. Um, you know, a mix of rural, urban, and suburban. And because of that, there's also some very interesting governance. But I think the one thing that we can all agree upon is just how amazing this facility is and how it is, a, you know, brings in all of the, the green technology and, um, you know, the green um, engineering that went into it. This building's amazing, and I think it's one of the things that we see a lot um, in terms of when we start conversations with other communities in the district about library services, okay. everyone points to this. Oh, well, well that Nantes library, could we get yeah. something like that? Yeah. And I think that's just uh, a testament to the amazing work that um, the Platteville uh, Public Library Board and also the staff did to make this happen. Everyone at the Platteville Public Library had an amazing collaborative spirit, and I think that consensus uh, shows off in that it's a place that's appealing for everybody. Uh, we also happen to use a lot of local materials, such as uh, natively selected grass mm -hmm. and beetle kill pine that comes from the Rockies. Yeah. And I believe that that integration of local materials shows that a green building like this can be inoffensive, attractive, and blend right in with the community. The town of Gilchrist itself is quite old. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a modern building, but not in the sense that it's off-putting. Yeah, it fits. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does, it does. And that's, yeah. that's what we went for. That's why we've got some of the design work that we have in here mm -hmm. um, with the kind of the industrial you know, farm farm right. look to it. Yeah. yeah. You do need the the architect mm -hmm. um, to design a building like this right. and you need the construction company to bring bring it into being. We uh we we do all our own mill work and all our own case work, you know, that's that's the finished product at the end of the uh, job. That's what everybody sees. So we we build that in house so when you, you walk through this library you're gonna see see woodwork, uh, on the ceiling, on the columns. Uh, you know, at the reception desk, all of that is, is done by us. I really enjoy our ceiling hmm. that is made from the beetle kill wood. Yeah. I think it's just really cool that we could find a use for that. Right. And I think it makes our building very unique. It's really cool to just be able to say, you know, we're one of the greenest libraries in the whole country, and that's, right. that's great. You wouldn't really expect it from a, a little town like this, but... It, it's it's really nice. I think we should be going way above code, or I think code should be changed, but that's hard to do, right? You've presented an example. I mean, by that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to lead by example, right? Fantastic. And I think it's important to note that a lot of the the materials that you see and a lot of the materials that you don't see are really off the shelf materials. There's there's nothing extreme or, or wacky about we, what we've done. Um, it's all readily available stuff, um, just put together in a slightly different way. Right. With a little more care. Right. A, a holistic or building as a system right. thought process behind it. Yeah, so. building as a body. I mean, this is a, a this is a living thing that we're in, and it it's going to continue to use power and move when we're not in it. 
and the less and the, the more logical that it does that will biomimic how our yeah. bodies work. We sweat, we breathe, we have a heating and cooling system, mm -hmm. and our breathing device isn't paired with our heating and cooling device <laughs> like you see many buildings. So right. we dissected this in pieces and then put them all back together in a different way with on-the-shelf talent and on-the-shelf materials. So now I get to spend time with Kelly and Cody getting in some of the nerdy details about this building, which is going to be fun. So it, for starters, as we look at things like the envelope of the building, Kelly, I'll look to you. The insulation details to make a passive house compliant or near passive house always have to be well above code. So what would you do here? What would you do in the foundation for starters? And we'll work our way up. So we'll start with the, the floor slab. Um, uh, we actually added uh, several inches of rigid foam okay. under the slab. In fact, um, we were required to have a minimum of R10 okay. by code. Uh, we actually have R38. Oh, wow. So that's almost four times as much. The walls are okay. constructed. It's basically, it's a double wall construction. Cool. So we have your typical two by six uh, wood framing at 16 inches on center, which okay. is what you might have in your house, for yeah. example. And we've installed cavity insulation, which again is what you might have on your house. Then we added a layer of, it's called nail base insulation. It's four and a half inches thick. Wow. It's like a SIPS panel, yeah. but it only has the wood on one side. Okay. And so we attach that to the framing system and the wood layer allows us to attach our finish so nice. that we don't have to drill through the entire assembly to reach a stud. Wall assembly, for example, uh, code minimum is R20. Okay. We have R34 okay. with our assembly. Yeah. So then when we think about our roof, um, as you can see, we've got some things going on. We've got a clear story here. Right. And this has, uh, also has cavity insulation plus a SIPS panel on top. So structurally insulated panels that they have on the rooftop are, are essentially an Oreo cookie of insulation. They have OSB on one side, OSB on the other side, or some sort of rigid material on there. And then in this case, multiple inches of expanded polystyrene foam, such as like you'd see in a styrofoam cup and that provides a great thermally broken insulation. But if I could interrupt just a quick, Paul, this, this, we gotta like make it super geeky. Remember that part in Christmas Vacation where the kid sticks his tongue to the frozen flagpole? <laughs> when that tongue got stuck to that flagpole, that's that, a thermal bridge. That's a thermal bridge, exactly. So when we say you have to break a thermal bridge, we don't mean pouring water on the dude's tongue. Right. We actually mean prevent that from ever happening to begin with. <laughs> Insulate that pole so nothing can ever get stuck to it and it'll never lose its temperature. <laughs> On that end down there, we basically have pre-engineered trusses, which is a really uh, common way to frame roofs, uh, especially if they're wood framed. And that also has cavity insulation and plus nail base insulation on top of SIPS panel. Yeah. And so our roof assembly is minimum R38. We have an R70. Okay. An R70, excellent. So yeah, so we're almost double with our walls and our roof yeah. and almost quadruple with our floor slab. Since this building was seeking to meet, you know, trying to get to passive house type of compliance, what challenges did you face, like with the architect, you know, with the passive, you know, passive house consultant, with the board? I mean, were there challenges in trying to build something like this, you know, at this level of performance? Well, it's, uh, I wouldn't say so much as a challenge, but more like putting together a puzzle from the uh, architect's uh, drawings, because when you're marrying up different type of materials, especially when you're not using conventional construction, getting everything to line up and be in a perfect plane and and being an exact uh, flat surface is difficult. You know, right. if you look at the roof, there's a, a marriage of trusses and sips, and none of those are the same thicknesses. So we had to really do a lot of uh, coordination and planning to make sure everything was flat when the roof came out and you know, wouldn't even know that it was there. Cody, I want to bring you in you know, on the airtightness side. So what did you do to make this building so much more airtight? I mean, the, the thickness of the walls, all the extra insulation, without question, helps, but then you did things beyond that to make sure the building was buttoned up really well. So yeah, buttoned do? up is a good term. And so to start with, 
um, we put in a very heavy duty radon mat. So we're gonna design that radon out and that's also a vapor barrier that's gonna protect our concrete and our insulation from taking on any moistures and stuff. And then we bring that up and we actually define on all sides uh, a red line. In fact, Kelly draws it in for us and it helps our contractors say, oh wait, although that's a shear wall, it's got a red line on it, so that's also our primary air barrier. And everything must be connected to the primary air barrier. So from that radon mat to the shear wall to the air barrier right behind that uh, tongue and groove ceiling there, all of these connections from doors to windows to the ceiling have to all be connected in one singular layer. The windows that were chosen, you know, and the window performance around them, are you able to share some of those details, like what was, what was done and why? Right, so um, we, we originally started with a super high performing uh, triple glaze window mm -hmm. uh, made by a local manufacturer. Um, and, and I believe what happened was uh, there were there was some procurement issues. Okay. Um, they were, I believe, a 16 week well, lead time that's happening these days for people in the construction, you know, all of us right. in the construction world. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. And so, so that became problematic. And so we landed on a uh, double pane, I believe, a U UPVC window that still met our energy criteria or close to it. Okay. So um, we got really close to the values. Um, I want to say we ended with a U.29 value, which is better than Energy Star. Right. Exactly. So it's still, you know, a rocking window. Right. Um, and it, again, it didn't break the bank. Exactly. Do you know what solar heat gain coefficient was as far as much of the sun's uh, um, energy coming I in? I don't, but it, was a, but it was a little on the high side okay. um, because we want to take advantage of the solar heat gain, especially right. in the winter months. And we, right. we design our building for that, mm -hmm. um, and that factors into our overhangs and our window placements. So right. we do want that to be uh, about average or slightly higher. Yeah, and that was part of doing the passive house modeling, so you could Get see that, that that was not going to be a penalty per se because right. many times in, in Colorado and other, other parts of the country we say well we're going to reduce that solar heat gain as much as possible. At times it's better to let more of it in and it's great that you're looking at through a modeling tool to be able to get to that. So sure. Cody I want to switch to you as we think about you know making a building very airtight then we've got to ventilate it right correct so it's like so you know the energy recovery ventilators in here, can you share what was chosen and, and why they were chosen and how they're operating? Yeah, absolutely. You know, in any commercial driven project, you know, you have your specifications, it goes out to bid and you have to have some flexibility for mm -hmm. things to change to get value engineered in or out. So windows kind of got adjusted from a fiberglass triple pane to a UPVC Reha, which is still a good protrusion or a, mm -hmm. a, a UPVC product and a good double pane. Thermally and then, broken. Thermally broken, right. that's right. And then the ERV side, you know, we have to have really good, high efficient recovery. And so although we had like a higher quality German Zender mm -hmm. or a Swiss product, mm -hmm. um, we had a Canadian product come in, which is instead of like a 90% efficient, we're looking at a 70% efficient. Okay. And we thought that that was a reasonable negotiation. So what's in here right now is Life Breath, okay. which is, is a very good performing and dependable and quiet. Um, and it's doing a great job here. We've got four of them in here, and so we actually have twice the, uh, the ventilation rate in here that a commercial building needs to have. I love to be in this building when my allergies are bad or when we have forest fires and lots of smoke. Yeah. Um, the air filtration system in here is very good at its job. Yeah. <laughs> it really helps calm down all my symptoms. Instead of recycling the air, which happens a lot in the commercial space, as we're bringing in brand new air, we're taking 70% of the temperature of the air leaving right. and we're putting it right back in. So we have a lot of fresh air in here, not just we're scrubbing the, the, the COVID and the virus out and all the allergies, but we're actually bringing in brand new oxygenated air from outside. The other thing is we didn't engineer out the gas here because gas is part of the culture here in Gilchrist, which is fine with us. It was very close. It didn't cost us a lot to put here. I think it was already here, in fact. Um, so this little on-demand hot water heater just does a micro load. And then matching it on the other side is a 97% efficient uh, HVAC system, which you'd find in a normal residence, right. uh, probably, you know, half the size of this or maybe right. <laughs> even less. Anyway, right. there's a little heater in there and, right. and it runs the air conditioner unit and it heats this building. So one of the passive solar features I really love about what you designed into this are the clear story windows 
They're up here on the south side, but are well shaded. Can you give me a little bit of the thought process on that, a little background on clear story windows? So, um, well, the, the term actually harkens back to the uh, cathedral days of, you know, the old churches in England and, um, and Europe. But hmm. um, when we were first 3D modeling this project, uh, one of the ideas from the board was that we take advantage of both the north and the south orientation. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, we've got solar panels on the south side soaking up the sun. Right. But we saw an opportunity to actually uh, break the roof. And that gave us an opportunity to not only install the clear story windows, but um, you know, added some interest with the glue lamb trusses and gave us some height and volume and, and the sound just kind of gets lost up in there. It's not real echoey. Right. And so um, it was kind of important to the board that we bring in as much natural light as possible. And, yeah. and you can see by looking up there that it's from that high up, it's a, a real kind of diffuse soft light yeah. um, because you know, glare's never good. Now Cody and I are hanging outside by the inverter for the solar PV system. And Cody, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, this is the, hub for the power of this building. How big is the solar PV system powering the Nantes Library? So this is about 17 kilowatts. Basically these panels are probably 300 watts per panel, somewhere in that range. All right. Yep. Yeah, so it's like, mm -hmm. you know, so this is, you know, for a typical home, this is about double, at least a typical home size, to what we'd see. So, but they yeah. need it obviously with the loads that they have, you know, in the building as far as additional lighting and things like that. So Computers, yep, and yeah. Right, so very, very cool. Kelly, I want to ask you a little bit about this room behind us, the storm shelter. Mm -hmm. That is not something we see in every building that we take a look at. So can you tell me, there's an intriguing story, at least a community connection, obviously, on, on this part of the building. So this is actually a, a tornado shelter. Mm -hmm. And what that means is it's literally a six-sided concrete box. Okay. And it was something that the board asked us to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a bid alternate because we weren't sure we weren't sure what the price tag would be. I want to say it was forty thousand dollars added cost, which the board felt was a good value because you know here they're in a in a small town and we are in tornado country. Right. And right. actually, we had a tornado here a few weeks ago that right. touched down. Right. And the Nearby. staff. Right. Uh, yeah, not two miles away. Right. Yeah. And the staff spent a little time in the tornado shelter, and right. uh, thankfully it uh, didn't cause any damage. But you never know. What about this building are you most proud of? I mean, everything about this building is just, it's wonderful and amazing. And I'm proud of our collection, I'm proud of the building, I'm proud of the staff that works here. Um, and it's, it's just exciting to get to know people on a different level here in Gilcrest. I'm proud of the fact that we know this building is going to be a long time standing because it is so sustainable as far as energy goes. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it is, it is kind of the, the crown jewel of the town. It's a useful crown jewel, mm -hmm. not just pretty. Right, yeah. very cool, a practical crown jewel. Mm -hmm. So remember when we talked about how many hair dryers it would take to heat this building? 1.75 hair dryers could heat this building on a typical January day. The Nantes Library, what a shining example of what happens when people come together behind a common selfless cause. The group was open-minded and willing to take in the knowledge and passion of leading board members. They were wise about how they chose an experienced and talented architect who was very good about listening to the board and library staff. The board and staff then brought in a skilled passive house consultant as well as a quality general contractor who knew how to build quality buildings and was still ready to learn about constructing high-performance buildings. This building is a beautiful outcome of these people's collaboration. I love having the opportunity to showcase a project where the best of a small town community, the ability to treat everyone with mutual respect, converged with the knowledge from the town to design and build the buildings of tomorrow today with high comfort and low energy bills. This building is very worthy of being replicated and I hope people follow their lead and have as much joy in bringing it into reality as this group did. I hope these stories inspire you to champion these strategies in a project you may be able to lead, whether as a board member, as an architect designing it, as a general contractor building it, or as the owner of a commercial building looking for ways to reduce your energy bills while enhancing the comfort for your occupants. Let us know if you apply these ideas to a project because who knows, 
You may just end up being showcased in a future episode of Heart of a Building. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.